Welcome to Image Bearers. My name is Atoma Eji. I am very, very excited to have on the program today, Dr. Stanley Howard Wass. Uh, Dr. Stanley Howard Wass, according to Wikipedia, is an American theologian, ethicist, and public intellectual. Howard Wass was a longtime professor at Duke University, serving as a Gilbert T. Rowe Professor of Theological Ethics at Duke Divinity School, with a joint appointment at the Duke University School of Law. Harawas is considered by many to be one of the world's most influential living theologians and was named America's best theologian by Time Magazine in 2001. He was also the first theologian to deliver the prestigious Gifford Lectures at the University of St. Andrews in Scotland in over 40 years. Harawas's book, A Community of Character, was named as one of uh, the 100 most important books on religion in the 20th century by Christianity Today. However, his most widely known book is Resident Aliens, which we'll talk about today. Um, subtitle is Life in the Christian Colony, which was co-written with William Williman. Thanks so much for joining us today. I'm glad to do so. So uh, again, today we're going to go through and just uh, discuss a few things in reference to Dr. Stanley Harawas's book, Resident Aliens. So again, the book was written in 1989, 33 years ago. Some of us perhaps were not alive even at that point. Um, however, in the intervening years, so much has changed. However, so much has also stayed the same. So the first question I have for you, Dr. Harawas, is what prompted you to write your book and how do you feel it still applies to God's church today? Um, Will and I had written an article in the Christian Century in which we suggested that much of Christian theology today uh, assumes that you don't need to believe in God in order to be a Christian. And uh, we, we uh, created a firestorm around what we thought was an obvious <laughs> uh, judgment. And uh, in response to that, we decided, well, suggested, why don't we do a book? And um, so uh, we discussed it about what we might say and resident aliens as a result. Okay. Yeah, I'm glad that uh, Will nudged you a little, I suppose, and you guys collectively wrote this book, I think. Uh, and we had a little chat before we started. Although it's written 33 years ago, it still resonates in an incredible way today. A uh, quick question, just as a follow up to that. Um, how do you feel like it still applies to uh, God's church today, resident aliens? I think that it rightly names the challenge of being Christian in a world that once was assumed to be Christendom. Mm -hmm. But the, that, that church had assumed to underwrite Americanism. Uh, it is increasingly coming to an end. And so I think insofar as the book is a call for Christians to recover the distinctiveness of what it means to be a people set apart from the world mm -hmm. without withdrawing from the world mm -hmm. uh, is still very relevant. The, uh, importance of the church forming people to be able to be uh, an alternative to just making more money where your kids can have more money when you die mm -hmm. uh, is uh, a real ongoing challenge that the book uh, encounters. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so one of the other things you mentioned in your book is that we can actually teach to prevent tribalism, which I thought was unique uh, and much needed, especially, I'm sure, uh, when you wrote the book in 1989, 
Uh, I'm sure there was a lot going on at that time, but I think in the intervening years, there's been so much tribalism that our country has faced, and a lot of it even within the church. And so, again, in your book, you mentioned that there, there is a way to teach that can prevent tribalism. Can you, explain, can you please explain the best way we can go about teaching in our churches that can prevent this? Well, first of all, it can be from the liberal perspective, the condemnation of tribalism that I want to, I want to support tribalism as an alternative to the presumption that we want to create people who believe they should have no story except the story they chose when they had no story and therefore refuse to, to acknowledge the tribe they are in, that they are in, that is the tribe of liberal modernity. So um, tribalism uh, can be uh, a positive development given what the alternatives may be. The tribalism that is make America great again, uh, no, uh, is one that Christians are to challenge exactly because we are a people who refuse to be identified uh, in a way that makes our Christianity uh, a secondary aspect of what it means to be a people of, of God in a world in which uh, our furthest neighbors, Christians in China, are um, our brothers and sisters in a way that uh, refuses to let nationalistic identification, which is the worst form of tribalism that's around today, uh, determine who we are. Mm -hmm. So if I'm understanding, it's, it's, it's really cutting the legs off of Christian nationalism to really help people not have that tribal connection to their country, if, if I'm understanding what you're saying. Right. Okay. That's right. Yeah, and I think, yeah. Part, I think part of that also would include, uh, which I think is what you're alluding to, that we're all one people all over the world. It doesn't matter if a person is, you know, here or South America, if we're Christian, we're Christian. It does not matter our nation. So uh, uh, we, we have a word for what people call globalization. Mm -hmm. It's called Catholic. <laughs> <laughs> we are a Catholic people. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, that, that definitely needs to be taught a lot more, not just in the United States. I think there's different parts of Europe and different other countries where, you know, tribalism seems to, and, you know, ethnic nationalism, should I say, is kind of rearing its ugly head. And I think that's a detriment to Christianity for sure. So another thing you mentioned in your book is, and you contrast Aristotle to Kant in reference to the teaching about morality. And I thought this was very unique. Um, so I, if I understand this correctly, Kant taught more of uh, like a democratic, you can correct me if I'm wrong on this, and Aristotle taught more of an elitist, which is not in a derogatory way, but more in the sense that you need someone who is moral if you want to learn morality. You can't just learn it logically. Right. Well, if you could maybe just break down uh, that a little bit, and also if you've, if you've seen our churches teaching more um, and I guess the term I'll use is a discipleship where one moral person teaches another moral person, or if we're just going through the classroom kind of teaching where it's more of a logical thing. So if you can maybe just break down that teaching of morality a little bit. Uh, I wanted to provide an account of morality that was a possibility for any human being based on rationality, qua rationality in and of itself. So you didn't need to be trained to be moral. You just needed to know how to universalize your moral maxims in a way that um, can be recognized by others. 
Aristotle um, assumed that to be and one, Aristotle doesn't have in the same way that Kant did the concept of morality. Uh, the very idea that you can abstract something called morality from um, fundamental uh, convictions about the way things are is uh, un unthinkable to uh, Aristotle. Mm -hmm. So uh, Aristotle thought that, for example, one of the um, indications of what it means to be a moral human being is how you laugh and what you laugh at. <laughs> so uh, Kant thought that was just irrelevant. So for Aristotle, you, the way you train someone to be moral is you start with something like teaching them how to ride a horse. Okay. Uh, so you develop the uh, skills necessary to uh, sustain a life that uh, makes the world different exactly because you have developed these skills. And to develop the skills, you need models that you can imitate. So masters are required to teach you how to ride horses or to wrestle. So uh, for Aristotle, therefore, it is the development of the virtues that creates people uh, to have lives that are morally worth living. For a Kant, virtues are secondary. Do you feel like our churches, uh, from your vantage point, are teaching more of the, um, you know, I, I call it discipleship, where one moral person is teaching another? Do you think we're leaning more towards that? Or no. just more rational? No. I mean, um, Jesus didn't say, believe in me. He said, come follow me. <laughs> True. And come follow me is a disciple move. Mm -hmm. So um, discipleship is at the heart of what it means to be a Christian. And that's not discipleship is a word that is not widely used in America to describe how one becomes uh, a uh, human being that lives well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, thank you. Um, so obviously, you know, a few years ago, the uh, death, really the murder of George Floyd, I think a lot of us have come to the point where we're like, you know, in a sense, we've been awakened, and I think in a good way to want to fight for justice. Um, but I think you had a cautionary tale even 33 years ago in your book about as we go after fighting for justice, we should be careful at the same time um, to make sure that we're not uh, just going about it the same way as the world. And if, if we have some desire to change the world, if that's our primary objective, which can seem noble, um, it can actually end up taming the church. Can you elaborate on that a little bit? Well, it's very hard to be against justice, and I'm certainly not. Mm -hmm. But to um, make justice isolated from traditions that tell you what the goods are that should be appropriately Mm -hmm. justly distributed is what it seems like to me we've been trying to do in a way that uh, ha has not been uh, good for anyone. Um, the, one of the, I mean, slavery, how, how in the United States, how do you respond justly? In fact, you've been a slave nation. Um, how do you how, how do you form justice when what was done was so wrong? There's nothing you can do to make it right. Um, 
justice is to rectify as much as possible um, the um, injustices that we all inherit. Abel's history is a slaughter bench. But justice cannot be just isolated as if you know what it is, separate from exemplification of what um, behavior that we call just looks like. Mm -hmm. And that justice, therefore, I mean, if, if you think about the phrase social justice, there's much good uh, that people want in that, in that phrase. But what kind of justice isn't social by its very nature? One of the things that the United States has tried to do is perform, is to provide institutional means to create a just society without people being just. Because justice is first and foremost a virtue that um, that um, shapes us to have judgments about, like I was just making about slavery, mm -hmm. make judgments that help us to know what must be done if we are to be a people capable of cooperative arrangements with one another. Yeah, I think what was very uh, powerful in your book, you mentioned that um, Pilate was seeking justice <laughs> and his justice and peace that he wanted to bring to his people is actually what resulted in the murder and the killing of, of Jesus. And so if we approach justice exclusive and outside of, you know, God and Jesus, we can do all kinds of horrific things. So, yeah, I, uh, I preached a sermon a few years ago in which, uh, it was right before the elect, one of the elections, and I said there was there was a democratic moment in the Gospels. They chose Barabbas. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Now I've been I've been reading about different historical figures, and uh, it doesn't matter which society, if if Christianity and Jesus are not there. It doesn't matter if it's communism, capitalism, it's all gonna fall, you know. Um, and anyway, that's not the point anyway. The point is the church, for the church to be what it needs to. So uh, uh, continuing on that real quick, um, can you provide some perhaps guidance or principles regarding some of the things the church should inv be involved in and perhaps should not be involved in? And I think you said the main thing is creating just people, but you know, if someone were to perhaps approach you in the street and say, hey, should we, should we, as a people, be involved in this or that? You know, what are some things you can say we should or not, should be involved in or not involved in? And it may vary based on a bunch of factors, but just your thoughts. I'm going to do one thing. Our friends that will tell you the truth. Mm -hmm. Do you want to know the truth about yourself? I, I think, it, I think that's, very hard to uh, want to know the truth. Mm -hmm. And I think uh, the church is where we've got nothing to lose if we tell one another the truth. Mm -hmm. So uh, I, uh, I mean, don't lie. And that's, that's not an easy thing. Mm -hmm. uh, so, yeah, lying is a form of self-protection mm -hmm. and uh, we uh, every good Friday we shout crucify and crucify that's who we are that's not a bad place to recognize where st truth starts mm -hmm. start with truth Okay, another thing you mentioned in your book um, is in reference to um, the church 
and, and the, specifically, I'll just go ahead and read it. It says, how does a church practically say and show in its life together that God and not the nations rule the world? Of course, I think that you start by being people committed to nonviolence. Okay. And that uh, I, I don't like the language of nonviolence because I don't want peace to be something that's not. And I don't like the language of pacifism because it's so passive. Mm -hmm. But I do believe that we are a people that will not kill in the name of good causes. And that's a harsh way to live. But uh, I think it reminds us that uh, we have a deep set of commitments mm -hmm. that are uh, not recognized by the general population mm -hmm. as a good thing. But it makes Christians interesting again anyway. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, it gets me thinking about the role of courage in our lives, you know, and I, I you know, you, you have been, your voice has been, been called a prophetic voice where you don't really care what, <laughs> what, la what side it falls on. Are you going to say what you need to say? But I do have a question. I think, uh, what would you say in reference to the role of courage, the importance of courage in our society right now? Um, let's say you have a young pastor who comes to you and, and they want to know like, Hey, I, I want to be courageous. What, what advice and how important would you say courage is? If I might, let me plug a book. I have a book okay. that's, um, fairly recent called character of virtue letters to a godson. Okay. And they were letters I wrote over 15 years to a godson about recommending a virtue. I, and in it, I, there's a chapter on courage, and I think it's pretty good. It's very interesting. Uh, the courageous, no fears, the coward will never know. Mm. Cause to be courageous creates a world that's more dangerous, exactly because we're courageous. And so the courageous, if, 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 if you are a person that thinks courage, it blocks out all fear, then you're just foolhardy. And that's not courageous. So courage means you're able to live enthusiastically in a way that you're determined not to let the fears that surround us determine our lives exactly because um, The way to live courageously is so much more interesting than, than uh, coward. So, uh, and courage, of course, I mean, it's so associated with, uh, with military life, and rightly so. But for Aquinas, the primary exemplar of courage was the martyr. Mm -hmm. Uh, so uh, it is those that take up the cross that I think uh, are the exemplification of courage. I agree. I think to imitate Jesus and be a pacifist, if that's, you know, not necessarily to use that language, but to not be involved in, in wars and these kinds of things, to stand up for the poor and you know, be poor yourself, depending on your situation, that takes courage. I don't think it's just, uh, that's not the easy road, you know, personal self-sacrifice. Uh, so you've written, uh, I think, somewhere around 50 books, give or take, um, including your memoir, you know, Hannah's Child. You've also written A Community of Character. Um, for someone who'd like to get into and learn more about your writing, where would you recommend they begin? What are maybe some of the books they could they could start with? Besides Resident Alien, it's probably The Peaceful Kingdom. Okay. Uh, which was uh, a book that was written as a kind of introductory book 
but uh, been widely used. And then I think the memoir, Hannah's Child, is, is many people tell me it's been very useful to them. Mm -hmm. uh, and then I have a little book called Prayers Plain Spoken. That's I'm sorry, prayer what? Prayers Plain Spoken. Okay. That uh, I think is uh, a, a book of prayers that I care about. That's awesome. So I know uh, you've lived uh, quite a few years. Looking back on your life, what's what's been uh, probably your most memorable few moments? Goodness. Um, that's uh, I don't. Uh, I've had so many. I've been a very lucky man. Uh, and, uh, I think uh, having a wife that loves me. <laughs> like you said, Aristotle said laughter is a uh, good medicine there, or it, that's how you can tell morality is, is you, laughter is one of them, you know. Um, so on that note, we have some things to wrap up as people, uh, we like to get to know each other a little bit more. So I have some lightning round questions so we can uh, get to know you a little bit uh, deeper. So the first question is, what's your favorite type of food? Mexican. I'm a Texan. Okay. <laughs> okay, good deal. Uh, favorite film or series? Favorite film? Yeah, or series. Um, Field of Dreams. Okay. Kevin Costner. Yeah, baseball. Okay. Baseball fan. <laughs> good deal. Good deal. Uh, right now, what would you say is your favorite book of the Bible? Luke. Okay. Has it been Luke for a long time or just recently? It's been for a long time. I wrote the commentary on Matthew. Okay. But uh, I've always loved Luke. Yeah, I, uh, I, I really like Luke. I like the beauty of John, but I like the practicality and the... The concreteness of Luke. Yeah, I, I really like Luke. I've come to like it. Uh, okay, who is your favorite Bible character? Uh, I like Abraham. Abraham? <laughs> okay. <laughs> Good deal. Did you was Abram your favorite character when you were younger? Now it's Abraham, or uh, uh, I don't remember. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> I I think it was Wiley. <laughs> yeah, yeah, he was. That's my sister. <laughs> okay, outside of the Bible, what's your favorite book or author? I like Iris Murdoch. Okay, Iris Murdoch. I have not uh, heard of English, English novels. Okay. Um, no, actually, actually, I like Trollope better than Murdoch. So they both Anthony Trollope. Okay, okay. I'll have to check that out. Um, what book do you think everyone should read in the next 12 months? Alistair McIntyre's Mac, Ethics in the Conflicts of Modernity. Okay. What, why, why would you say that, just briefly? Well, one, it's, it's a philosophical read, and it's very difficult. But uh, I think he gives us the best account of the world in which we find ourselves, of anyone that I know. His other book, After Virtue, is also a must read book. Okay, I'll check those out. In the last 50 years, what would you say is the most important theological book? Karl Barth's Dogmatics and Outline. Okay. 
And I know you and I spoke a little earlier, and I know you've read uh, Bonhoeffer's Black Jesus, which yeah. I know there's a little bit of interplay between Bonhoeffer and Karl Barth and yeah. so forth, but okay. Thank you, Spock. Yeah, 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 yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. Okay, what's your favorite place to live and where would you most like to visit? My favorite place where I, to live is where I live. Uh, Wise man. North Carolina, in the okay. woods. <laughs> Good deal. Um, if you could place a billboard in the middle of your city or in your city, what would it say? John 316. <laughs> okay. Okay. Save that from, from losing its meaning. I mean, put on a billboard is one of the real uh, challenges. Yep. And what's your favorite music? Uh, I, uh, I don't listen to music as much as I used to, but uh, uh, I love, I mean, I love bluegrass. Okay, good deal. All right. Well, definitely, uh, thank you, thank you, thank you for your time. I know. Uh, tell me, uh, let me ask you a little about you. Sure, sure. Uh, where are you from? I was born in Malawi in Africa. Where did you study? I, I studied at Michigan State University, but I also studied in England for a year, I think a couple of years. And I was in South America. That was when I was a kid, though, seven. Uh, denominationally, what are you? Uh, Church of Christ. Well, that's right. I remember we talked about that. Yeah. And do you, uh, do you read Church of Christ theologians? Richard T. Hughes. And then um, I'm not sure if you know him, but uh, Michael Burns is one of the members in our church, the International Church of Christ. He's written Escaping the Beast. I should, maybe I'll see if I can get you a copy. Um, those are the main two I would say right now. I see. You, uh, they have some fine young uh, theologians at Abilene Christian. Are you connected with that part of the church? No, not myself personally, no. We do have connections, but not myself personally. I see. It's lovely to meet you. Yes, no, it's very good to meet you. And you know, I dived into Resident Aliens and I definitely will be picking up more of your books. I think I'll probably go with uh, Hannah's Child next. And then I'll rewatch this video and kind of look at some of the ones that you, you kind of called out. So thank you. Uh, always feel free to get in touch with me. Yes, no, I, I will be sparing. You've, you've lived a long life and you deserve some rest, so. <laughs> oh no, feel free to touch, get in touch. It's lovely meeting you. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you everyone for watching our show today. I do appreciate for our program today. I do appreciate, uh, again, Dr. Stanley Harawas for your time and your life's work. Uh, just amazing. And I hope many will be encouraged to read your works and also to really just go after becoming more virtuous and really more courageous. I know that, uh, and I guess I'll just ask one last thing as we've got a, maybe a tiny bit of time. I almost think that the way that we read the Bible is incorrect. If we come out of reading the Bible without having more compassion, without becoming better people, without really understanding the Sermon on the Mount, the way that I think you expound, you and others expound it. Um, I guess just in closing, what's your thoughts in terms of how we, we read the Bible? Do you think that seminaries are getting better in really teaching people to read the Bible or what's your general perception? He recommended a book that I wrote. It's called Unleashing the Scripture, Freeing the Bible from Captivity to America. And in the book, I argue that historical criticism and fundamentalism are two sides of the same coin. They're both the result of the Protestant heresy of Sola Scriptura. that got turned into Sola text through the invention of the printing press that was then given ideological formation 
by the creation of something called the democratic citizen that believes they can read text without moral training or spiritual guidance. So the only thing we can do today is take the Bible away from American Christians and tell them that they must learn to read it um, uh, in sackcloth and ashes. <laughs> so uh, I'm, uh, I'm very sympathetic uh, with the presumption that you just don't pick it up and read it. You've got to be formed to read it well. Yeah, wow, that's a takeaway. Well, thanks again for your time. Definitely have a great rest of the day. Thank you.